words of wisdom, how to become wise, prosperous, and fruitful. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask that these words will become bread of life to us today. I ask that they would shift our souls and sanctify our souls and bring us into everything that you want for us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. I don't always get to do things my way. When I started this breaking through to um, our basic essentials for breakthrough series, I wanted to start out on January 1st, actually it was the 7th, but I wanted to start out with a message on reading the Bible as a foundation of breakthrough. It was a Bible that moved Martin Luther to kick against the goads and condemn the excesses and the corruption of corruption in the Roman Catholic Church. He took 95 theses and nailed them to the door of the Wittenberg Catholic Church on October 31st, 1517. He said it's wrong because they were selling indulgences. If somebody wanted to keep on sinning, they could pay a price that would go to help build the Wittenberg Church Chapel. And, and he, he thought this was wrong. He thought it was wrong for them to force the people to attend Mass in Latin and have Latin Bibles that most of them couldn't speak or, or, or read. And he wanted the Bible to be available to the common people. I know Luther was not a perfect man, but he was a chosen man. And can I say to you, you may not be a perfect man or woman. I'm certainly not. But you are a chosen man or woman. But I was surprised when God didn't want to go with my plan and let me preach on the, reading the Bible the very first Sunday in Jan of 2021. God wanted us to take a look back, a look ahead. He wanted us to consider entering our prophetic destiny. He wanted us to get to know him as a person. He wanted us to learn how to tune in, tune into the right voice. He wanted us to understand the practice of coming into right alignment so we can hear God's voice and have power to minister. And he wanted us last week, and I know it was deeper than some of my preaching is, but he wanted us to understand that true sanctification flows from the tree of life, not from the tree of the knowledge and good and evil. Now, finally, two months later, I get to preach on what I wanted to preach on, the essential of building our lives upon the Word of God. And I didn't understand at first why God didn't want me to do it my way, but I do understand now because of that, that we couldn't come to this point until the previous messages were, were understood. You see, the Bible doesn't really become a method of breakthrough until we understand God has a destiny for our lives, until we come to know Him personally, until we learn how to turn into the right voice, walk in right alignment of spirit, soul, and body in that order, and sanctification from the tree of life. When I began ministering full-time in the 1970s, the early 70s, I led a youth group on, for six weeks on what we called WOW, words of wisdom. We read a proverb every day in our own homes. We read a proverb a day, every day for six weeks, for five weeks. And then each week we met to discuss what God was speaking through the book of Proverbs. And it was quite good. Enjoyed it. If you want to know the mind of God, read Proverbs. Then in the late 70s, I was convicted to start reading through the Bible once a year. Unfortunately, as I became increasingly religious, the Bible became a club from the tree of knowledge rather than, than the life-giving thing God wants it to be. I began using my Bible to beat people up, including myself. Thankfully, that has changed since I learned about the tree of the, our life when I was re attending Wagner leadership at the turn of the century. When people are in right alignment and listen to God's voice, the Bible becomes life-giving and releases words of wisdom. Number one, moving beyond singing the song to living the life. 
the first scripture Holy Spirit led me to is one we learned on, on in vacation Bible school or Sunday school. The wise man builds his house upon the rock. We just sang it. But let's look at it from the Word of God. Letter A, it's more about relationship than reading. People reading the Bible with their heads rather than a personal relationship with God become stuffed with facts apart from the feelings of being one with God. Jesus makes it clear it takes personal connection with God to receive his word. Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the realm of heaven's kingdom. It's only those who persist in doing the will of my heavenly Father. On the day of judgment, many, say many, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, don't you remember us? Didn't we prophesy in your name? But I'll have to say to them, go away from me, you lawless rebels. I've never been joined to you. Or as the King James says, I never knew you. Letter B, Jesus is the gate to understanding the Bible. We can memorize the Bible. We can even try to live the Bible. But the Bible is lifeless apart from Jesus. We need to know the Word of God and the God of the Word. John 1 begins with, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the, was with God, and the Word was God. All things are known through Him. Jesus is the narrow gate that leads to life. He says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is a gate, broad is a way that leads to destruction. And there are many, there He says it again, there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is a gate, and difficult is a way that, which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Pam, after she's way back in the late 70s, I led her and her family to the Lord, started coming to church, and she said, late, years later, she said, you know, you're preaching a false gospel. You were saying to people, all you need to do is, is, is turn to Jesus, come to him, and everything's going to be hunky-dory after that. That's just not the truth. The devil doesn't even dislike you until you accept Jesus. That's when the fight begins. That's why Jesus said, if any man comes after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross. What are crosses for? They're not to wear around your neck, they're to die on. If you want to come after me, if you want to be my disciple, take up your cross and follow me. Let us see that the Bible becomes our wisdom only when we apply it to life. Back from our scripture that we sang, everyone who hears my teaching and applies it to his life can be, a, can be compared to a wise man who built his house on an unshakable foundation. When the rains fell and the flood came and the winds, fierce winds beating upon his house, it stood firm because of its strong foundation. God gave me a, fig, a funny picture here. Knowing the word of God and not applying it is like walking on one leg. You can hobble, you can hop, but you're not going to get anywhere fast. The same is true in trying to apply the Bible and the Christian life apart from knowing and living the Bible. They have to work together to give you a stable walk that takes you all the way to your destiny. Letter D, this might surprise you. It can be dangerous to hear Jesus' teaching and not walk it out. Jesus said, anyone who hears my teaching and does not apply it to his life can be compared to a foolish man who built his house on the sand. When it rained and rained and the flood came with winds and waves beating upon the house, it collapsed and was swept away. Light received brings more light. If you receive what the Word of God is saying, if you receive what God's speaking through the music or through the message, you'll get more light. It'll increase. Light rejected brings darkness. If a person does not commit adultery, for example, but gives into lust or pornography, 
he or she walks in darkness, which will bring more darkness. If you come to the light of the word and repent of what's wrong, then increasingly, increasing light will come. Letter E, if you really know Jesus and really hold to his teachings, you become overwhelmed by his presence. That's where I want to live. How about you? Where his presence is so close and tangible that you know he's walking with you every day. Is just a closer walk with Jesus, your plea. Matthew 7, 28, 29 from the uh, Passion Translation. By the time Jesus finished speaking, the crowds were dazed and overwhelmed by his teaching because his words carried such great authority, quite unlike their religious scholars. Pam and I did a couple of deep healings this week, and one was a lady that lives two and a half hours north of here, so we did it by Skype. And we just begin, began the meeting, and Pam is the intercessor, and she writes down what God's telling her. She wrote, wrote down, horrible headache. So without even saying anything about it, I prayed that this horrible headache that this woman had would leave and she began to weep she had a horrible headache we prayed god took it away and time after time during that two-hour appointment pam would write something down we had act upon it and the woman would be blessed she wrote back to me last night or the night before and said my husband says i'm different i'm even treating my father better <laughs> Meeting with the Word of God and following it. Number two, building your life on the Word of God. Letter A, eat the bread of life and be strong. I tell you, the Bible doesn't do you any good sitting on the coffee table or on a shelf. I remember I was visiting a guy that pretended to be a great Christian one day, and, and we were having a religious discussion, and I said, I hadn't brought a Bible. And I said, well, do you have a Bible? And he said to his daughter, get, get that book daddy's always reading. <laughs> I won't even tell you what book she brought. It was not the Bible. <laughs> Jesus says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, Matthew 4, 4. Jesus would, withstood attacks, attacks from the devil. He withstood attacks from people. He conquered every temptation by clinging to the spoken word of God and the written word of God. I don't think Jesus ever missed a day of reading the Bible and listening to God. And if Jesus needed that, don't you think we do? Letter B, set regular meal times. And I'm talking about spiritual meals here. People tend to become cranky if they do not eat their meals on time. Ask any mother, ask any wife. We become spiritually anemic when we fail to feed on the, the bread of life. And then let her see, follow a plan. I'm married to one of the world's best cooks, and she usually prepares her meals in advance, but there are days when other things get in the way. And sometimes I offer to prepare a balanced meal, popcorn with real butter and salt, <laughs> followed up with an ice cream treat, we both enjoy it. We wouldn't be very healthy if we didn't follow a better meal plan for 18 to 20 meals a week. It is important to plan your work when it comes to Bible reading and to work your plan. For Pam and I, the very best time works first thing in the morning. Our first cup of coffee, we sit down. We read the Bible. We pray together. For the last six months, we've listened to Dutch Sheets and has given me 15 programs. And then we get up and about our day. For other people, it works best just before going to bed. I can't understand that. People are reading their Bible at 11 o'clock at night. Is God even awake then? <laughs> but they find he's awake. I guess he never slumbers nor sleeps. The timing isn't nearly as important as the consistency. Pam and I always read from the Old Testament and New Testament every day. Now think of this. The New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. I'll tell you, once you understand the Old Testament or the New Testament, 
Then when you read how Adam and Eve sinned, and they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves, about the size of a maple leaf, tried to cover their nakedness that way, and God killed an animal and made cloaks of skin for them. You don't really understand that until you read, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him might not perish but have everlasting life. You don't understand the sac uh, sacrifices of the Old Testament until you read about Jesus' sacrifice in the New Testament. But then the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. You just can't fully understand the Old Testament without the New Testament. That's why the Pharisees were so confounded. And you can't fully understand the New Testament without understanding the Old Testament. I'll repeat it. The Old, New Testament is in the Old Concealed. The Old Testament is in the New Revealed. Now, Pam and I use different programs over the years. And just like we'd not like to eat popcorn and ice cream for every meal, people shouldn't eat just the Old Testament or just the New Testament. A well-balanced diet is better. We've got in the back, and I could make some more if we run out of them. We have reading plans that, that show you a way you can read through uh, the one... You can read the New Testament and just the New Testament, or you can read the Solid Life Reading Plan where you read the New Testament and the Old Testament, or the three number two plan, one two plan where you read the Old Testament once and the New Testament twice a year. It's not that hard. Pam and I have done the two, um, two one plan for, or the one two plan for probably the last 10 years. It takes you half an hour a day, sometimes more, sometimes a little less. But what's more important than looking into the Word of God? Number three, benefits for building your house upon God's Word. Letter A, I don't know why I need to share this. I argued with the Lord about it. But one year, way back in the 70s, I had read through my Bible and was done with it for the year. And I thought, I'm going to read the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha is a book that, that some traditions and some churches put between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's a series of, of ancient writings. And I thought, well, God, I'm done with the Bible, so I'm going to start reading the Apocrypha over the next week or two. Within two or three days, I was spiritually anemic. I really felt the loss of power because I wasn't being will, well fed by what the true word of God is. It's okay to read the Apocrypha, but it's the Old Testament, it's a New Testament that brings you life and strength. So what are the benefits of, of building your house on the rock of God's word? Letter A, the first benefit is purity. I love the way the, trans, the Passion Translation says it. How can a young man, a young woman, stay pure? Only by living in the Word of God and walking in its truth. Letter B, the second benefit is a complete makeover. Wow. You see these people on TV, they get a complete makeover physically. And somebody that was ugly as a swine becomes beautiful as a pearl. Well, the Word of God can do that to you spiritually. Think of it. Complete makeover of mind, will, and emotions. James wrote to the people who were in the worst of times. Christianity was being mocked. Employment was not secure. There was a lot of infighting. Parents or even families were dividing over the faith and believing in Jesus Christ. And James warns people, be, you're in danger of becoming double-minded. That's actually a word that, that everybody thinks that James invented. Dipsukos. Divided soul. And James came up with this, this word to describe people that, that aren't fully in to the word of God. And he said, you're double souled, you're mixed up, you're, you're dissociated, you're, you're fragmented. But then he shares a, a truth in, a little bit later on. He says, get rid of all uncleanness and the rampant outgrowth of wickedness and in a humble, gentle, modest spirit, receive and welcome the word of 
which are implanted and rooted in your hearts contains a power to save your souls. Now, wait a minute. James is writing to people who are already saved. He was writing to people that were so standing for Jesus that they would face death rather than deny Jesus. And he says, people, you need to get your soul saved. You may be born again, but your soul, your mind, the way you think, your emotions, the way you feel, and your will, the way you choose, still needs to be saved. And he said the engrafted word has the power to bring your soul and your mind and your spirit into right alignment. Holy Spirit and our human spirit taking charge of our mind, will, and emotions, taking charge of our body. So James says you need to learn how to graft, engraft the Word of God in your heart. It's kind of like orchard guys do. They, they'll take a, a, a tree, I think it's a peach tree, and engraft a plum tree into it, and they'll get a nectarine. God says if you engraft my Word in your heart, I will save your soul. Everyone who remains in the Word of God and lets that Word remain in him becomes increasingly productive in Christ-like in the tree of life. Number three, the third benefit is a promise of success. God were to visit your home today and knock on the door and said, if you do this, you'll be successful in everything you do. Would you be interested? You might say, well, Lord, does that mean I'll get promotion on my job? He said, if you do what I tell you to do, you'll be successful in anything. Does it mean I'll get my finances straight now? He'll say, well, if you do this, you'll be successful in everything you do. Well, I get my marriage straight now. Well, if you do this, you'll be successful in everything you do. And there's two places that I know of in the Bible that promises. God says, if you do this, you'll be successful in everything you do. One of the very first passages I memorized was Psalm 1, 1 through 3. I was a goof off all through my high school years, far more interested in dating and making money than learning anything. I thought about going to college when I graduated. I wanted to become a band director. But I had such an inferiority complex, I gave up on the idea when I learned I'd have to audition for the music program. But I had a good job. And my greatest goal in life became to work my way up the ladder at the grocery store where I was working until I became the manager and maybe someday the owner. Then at age 21, I got saved. A year later, I was called to the ministry. And one of the requirements for the job I had was going to the very same college I was afraid to go to. I didn't think I could do it. I never carried a book home when I was in high school. I was, a, I was a submarine student, mostly below sea level. <laughs> but then God reminded me of Psalm 1. Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits on the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Whenever you're reading the Bible, uh, especially in the Old Testament, and you see the word Lord in all capital letters, or sometimes the capital letters are small, but they're still capital O, capital R, capital D. Every time you see that, it's, it's giving you the name Jehovah. And it says if you meditate on the word of Jehovah, you'll, and not let it depart from your mouth, that you may observe to do according to all that's written in it, then you'll make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. You know, I found that true. I went to Spring Arbor, I was afraid. And I really struggled with my classes, and then God reminded me of Psalm 1. So I went back to memorizing the Word and meditating on it at night, and I got to where I was in the high Bs and, and low As. I made it to the Dean's List. I graduated in four years. All because I took God at his word. I knew if I did what God said, God would do what he said that he would do. And I discovered this not only worked for me, but also for those I counsel. Remember a teenager 
who had dropped out of school because of drug addiction. Back then it was LSD. When I met him, he could hardly carry on a conversation. Right in the middle of a sentence, he'd forget what he was talking about. But I led him to Christ, and he sensed a call on his life, but his mind wasn't getting any better. So I challenged him to do the impossible. Memorize John, Joshua 1, 8. Think about it when you're awake. Think about it when you wake up at night. Just memorize it. Meditate on it. He went back and got his GED. Then he said, I want to go to the college you went to. So I took him up there and he, uh, they gave him a chance. He said, we'll, we'll, we'll put you on probation. You can start school here. And he too proved the Lord's promise true. He graduated in four years, became a youth guidance counselor, dedicated his life to ministry. Nothing can hold a person back who meditates on God's Word. Number four, visit every section in the library of Scripture. The Bible is not a book, but a library. Just like the Sturgis Library, there are several sections in it. Each section is special and meets some important needs. We're told to study and show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. So let's take a deep look at the library of Scripture. In the Older Testament, there's the Torah, the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And let me tell you, if you're trying to read straight through, you read Leviticus, and that's giving of the law, and you read Deuteronomy, and that's a second giving of the law. It's a repeat, just warning you. The historical books are Joshua through Esther, the Hebrew poetic literature is Job through the Song of Solomon. Do you know that Job was written as a play? If you look at, like in the old King James, there, there's Act 1, there's Scene 1. It, it's lit, it was actually done as a play, but it's the earliest book of the Bible. The Psalms and songs are our songs that reveal the heart of God. If you want to know God's heart, I'll give you a challenge. I've done it several times. Read five, five psalms a day. Today is, psalm, or today is February 21, so you'd read Psalm 21, add 30 to it, 51, add 30 to it, 81, add 30 to it, 121, add... I got off of my counting there. But anyways, you do that five times. Tomorrow you read Psalm 22, 52, 82, 112, and one, add 30 to it, 42. And you do that, you get to know the, the heart of God. The Proverbs reveal the wisdom of God. And I've done this several times. I haven't done it for a few years. Maybe I should. But if you want to walk in wisdom, read a proverb every day. Today is the 21st. Read Proverbs 21. Then there are the, prophet, the major or former prophets, Isaiah through Daniel. There's the minor prophets, Hosea through Malachi, or as the Italians call it, Malachi. I thought it was funny. The only reason the minor prophets are called minor is because they're shorter. And I'll prove to you how major they are. Peter quoted Joel 2.28 to 32, one of the minor prophets on the day of Pentecost, showing how important that text of Joel was. In the Newer Testament, there's the Gospels. Gospels means good news. Most people divide them between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Some set John apart as a Johannine Gospel because it is written different than the other ones. There's the Apostolic History, which is really the Acts of the Apostles. There's a Pauline Epistles. And epistles just means letters, letters to the Romans through Philemon. And the General Epistles. The letters in their order sometimes vary in different translations, but the general epistles include Hebrews, James, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, 1, 2 and 3, John and Jude. And people don't really know who wrote the book of Hebrews. You say, well, my King James says, book of Hebrews by Paul. It's not in the Greek, I've looked. Some think Priscilla might have written it. It was written with a, just a, Whoever wrote it was really intelligent and well-schooled. 
And then there's the first, second, third John, which are sometimes called the Johannine epistles. And then there's the apocalypse or the revelation, written by the same John who wrote the little books of John and the gospel of John. Apocalypse is a really interesting name, word. In 2 Corinthians, I think it's 4 verse 3, it says that, that the unsaved cannot get saved because they have a calypsis, a veil over their eyes. It's described as something that's very real, a, a shield that keeps people from seeing the word of God. In the Greek, they, they add the word a, alpha, to a word to make it mean the opposite. We do that in English. We say born, unborn, fruitful, unfruitful, productive, unfruitful. But here the, the revelation, the apocalypse, is putting ah, not, in front of veiled. So when we tear down the veil, the apocalypse, a revelation of God is able to come to us. Number five, make sure... Make yourself complete by studying the Word of God. Second Timothy. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, or some Bibles say for training in righteousness, that the man of God, that the woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, a lot of people don't like the word doctrine, and all doctrine means is teachings. We need the teachings of the Word of God. And something interesting about that verse we just read in 2 Timothy, that was written before the New Testament was written. It was a letter that wasn't considered part of the canon of Scripture until years later. And when Timothy wrote that, he was saying, all the Old Testament is given by inspiration and God looked ahead and all the New Testament is given by inspiration. Well, when Timothy wrote it, the New Testament wasn't yet. Now, I've been told that bank tellers, Alexis, is that true, that you learn how to tell counterfeit money by handling real money? Yeah. Okay. It's the same thing. You learn to handle, to discern the counterfeit when you know to how to correctly handle the Word of God. I don't know about you, I'm deeply grieved for the state of our country. I'm even more grieved for people who call themselves Christian and support abortion, same-sex marriage, taxing rich to enable the poor to not work, but to eat without working, even though the Bible says that a person who does not work and take care of his family is worse than an infidel. But people are deceived because they do not know the Word of God. They don't know the Word of God and they don't know the God of the Word. Jesus answered and said to those people, Ye do err. Why? Not knowing the Scriptures nor the power of God. Again, I'm concerned for our country. If God doesn't judge America soon, he will have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm concerned for America. And why are we so corrupt? Because we err in not knowing the Word of God. Studying the Bible, meditating on it, letting it guide you through life is a basic essential for breakthrough. And it's one that's within the reach of every person. All you have to do is choose to pay the price of setting time to get to know the Word of God and the God of the Word. I remember when I was first saved in 1972, it wasn't long until I was convinced that I was supposed to read the Bible a little bit every day and pray every day. And I began doing so. 1978, I heard a preacher, and I was pastoring by then. I heard a preacher say, I read through the Bible every year cover to cover because when I get in the pulpit, I want to have something good to give to the people. And I was convicted, and I began reading through the Bible once every year. And then in 1993, Pam and I were married in 92, and she said, 
Can we do our devotions together? Until then, I'd done them all by myself. Quite often did them in my office. And I was so tickled when she asked, can we do it ourselves? Together. And I said, of course. And we started reading, and, and I picked a plan because I've been doing it for so long. But I picked a plan, and we'd just take turns. She'd read five verses, I'd read five verses. Or we might read a paragraph, and then I read a paragraph out out loud. And every day since then, every day since then, not, we haven't missed once. Every day since then, we have read the Word of God out loud to each other. Now, why is that important? Because faith comes from hearing. When I'm on the road and Pam isn't, she reads it out loud, loud to our dog. Because faith comes from hearing. I don't know if Sarge has much faith yet, but <laughs> she does, Pam does. And then in, I think it was 2010 in this church, we were convicted to start reading through the Old Testament once a year and the New Testament twice a year out loud with each other and began doing so. Every step that we have taken has brought us closer to God and closer to each other. If you can imagine a, a, a big line going up to a peak, you take a couple, the closer they are to God, the closer they are to each other. How valuable is that? Each one of these steps in my life and later in pans of my life brought us closer to God and closer to each other. Each time we were convicted to do something and started doing something and it became a lifestyle that blessed our lives. And everybody sitting here today is at that point today. Just commit to begin doing whatever you're convicted to do. Meditate on the word of God and he says, your way will be prosperous and you will be successful and all that you'd do. If you would, bow your heads for prayer. And Holy Spirit, before I pray, I ask that you will speak. Speak to each person what you want them to do concerning the Word of God. Now, there's a really important thing about conviction. If you act on it, he'll give you the strength to do it. And if you slip away, at first he will remind you of it. And if you ignore his promptings, then you'll forget them. And that, that's not a good thing to do. So home in your heart, just between you and the Lord, or maybe between you and your spouse, We'll say, we're going to start this now. It might be a chapter a day. That's really good if you haven't been doing anything every day. Lord, I ask your blessing on every commitment that's being here, made here today. Lord, I pray that you'll help these dear people get to know the Word of God better and to get to know the God of the Word better. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Would you stand for a blessing? Father, I thank you today that as people hide your word in their hearts, you will keep their past pure. We bless them today with that ability to grasp the, the thank you, Lord, to grasp the word of God. God just told me that some of you get sleepy when you try to read the Word of God or that your mind kind of goes numb. Right now, in the name of Jesus Christ, we break the power of the spirit of slumber and the spirit of stupor. I want you to just blow when I tell it to leave. Spirits of slumber and stupor, loose these people. Go right now to the feet of Jesus. Make it go and it's gone. Lord, we pray for a connection between the Spirit of God and the spirit of men and women 
and the word of God. And we bless them that they stand on the solid rock. And no matter what happens, they will remain firm in Jesus' name. Amen.